Hello and welcome to the Sonic Society, the weekly showcase of the radio and patio audio drama from around the world. If you hear in the background, we have been invaded by munchkins. Hi! Hi! I have all three sons with me tonight as it's March break and we get to spend a whole lot more time together. Say hi, boys. Hi! <laughs> we got to say hi twice there. I have Aiden, Colm, and Rory. Hi! <laughs> Tonight we present part two of Quest for the Passion Stone from Circus 13 Productions. So sit back and relax and enjoy episode number two here on the Sonic Society. Galen! <laughs> Ingus! Uh, we. We have to get to Allurus! I don't know how to get there! <laughs> I do! Go find Nada. She can lead us there. <laughs> Who's Nada? How do I find her? <laughs> do it! <laughs> Is that the only way? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what about you? Are you going to be okay until I get back? Yes. Just, just hurry. As, as fast as you can. No. There must be another. Go! Lord Varric. Well, you really outsmarted yourself, didn't you, Rasberg? What do you mean, my lord? What I mean? That's a horned moron. If you brought the Winter Wolf, the holy lizard bitches first night to my damn throne room. Unless we actually kill this son of a bitch that literally destroy us. I thought I would bring him here for Bob to play with before he... Killed him! It was a good thought, my lord. I would like to see how tough he thinks he is. You think so, Bob? You really think so? You get the way from me. Yes, my lord. I do. I have never been able to test the limits of my abilities against one who is so willful. It should prove to be an interesting challenge. Perfectly, my lord. You two goblins, come here and take the troll to my chambers. Jerick, I'll be very happy to throttle thee with my bare hands when next we see each other. I really don't think so, Varric. You'll probably be chained to a wall. If not, Bob usually breaks his toys when he plays with them. He plays quite roughly. Ah! <laughs> the ultimate boxing bar and grill. What the hell kind of place is this? Well, this is where Angus said Nada should be. So...
I hope that's not her sitting at the bar. Maybe I'll ask the bartender. Hey, Fred. What? You got that ring clean yet? No. The last guy you fought bled an awful lot. We might have to send that canvas out to get it cleaned again. Damn it, Fred. Why didn't you just put down the plastic sheet like I asked you? Excuse me? Could you tell me where to find... Oh. Stupid, stupid little man. Oh. Um, that wouldn't happen to be Nada, would it? Oh no. Here, Fred, let me help you up. Here, sit down. I'm sorry. Let me buy you a drink. You look like thunder. How did you... Family resemblance. Jack, go get Fred some antiseptic. I got business to discuss. Now, Jack! So how did you... What? Know you're the Thunder Savage? Yeah. Easy. You have the look about you. The look? Yes. I knew Paul St. Valentine personally. But not to dwell on it, you must be here for a reason. And usually when someone from Queen Nedra's court shows up, it means one of two things. Either there's a fight coming or someone's hurt. Well? Well what? Which is it? Uh, both actually. So Jarek is finally showing he's got a pair, huh? Must be Bob pushing things along behind the scenes, because if it was actually up to Jarek, he'd wait another 40 years until Nedra's only defenders were Angus the Jester and Metalhead the Goblin. Have you met them yet? Yeah, actually, Angus is the one who's... Yeah, they're a trip, don't you think? Sorry, you were saying? Um, Angus is the one who's hurt. Me, Angus, and Varric had a run-in with Iceberg and four goblins. The Winter Wolf is still alive? What happened? Who injured the Jester? Varric was captured by Iceberg. His goblins hurt Angus and then grabbed Varric so Iceberg could hit him. And what did you do? Nothing? Did you just sit there and watch them? I couldn't do anything. I was so scared. What was I supposed to do? Don't worry. It isn't your fault. Even people who are from the Ender Hollow have problems when they see Bob's goblins. Anyway, we'll discuss that later in your training. Take me to Angus so we can help him. Varric Winter. The Winter Wolf. Oathbreaker to Iceberg. First knight to the Holy Dragon Queen Nedra. At last, I have you in a position to do with you as I will. I can keep you alive a long time to play. Damn you. <laughs> ah, such originality in your impetuousness. I truly wish I could remember what it must be like to be that brash. Ah, but I have lost all my feelings except joy. <laughs> joy? Towards what can thou feel joy, wizard? Pain? The pain of others? Right on the nose, Winter Wolf. Pain is no longer a sensation for me to feel, but to give. And I give it freely to those I choose worthy enough to feel such a joyous sensation. And thou art saying that you are deeming me worthy of this joyous sensation of pain? Indeed, Sir Beric. Indeed. So, are we ready for your first lesson in pain? And how long is this lesson going to take? As long as you want, or as long as it takes. Whichever comes first. All right, then just get it over with, sadist. Indeed. <laughs> Uh-oh. Where did he go? I left him right here! Calm down, Galen. He's probably just hiding. Look around a bit. You're right. We can't help him if we panic. Angus! Angus! Ang- What? What is it? How many goblins did you say were with Iceberg? Four. Come on, we have to see the Queen. What's going on, Nada? I see traces of four goblins and two unnamed here, which means they came back and grabbed the Jester. Oh no. Yeah, oh no. Where were you guys going when you were attacked? Off to see an angel named Allura or something so she could tell me about Paul St. Valentine and the Love Rock. Love Rock? 
Wait a minute, that's not right. Uh, it was something like that. Uh, oh, gee, uh, love, uh, lust, uh, uh, passion. That's it! The passion rock! No, no, the, the, the passion pebble, the, the passion... The passion stone! Are you sure it was the passion stone? Positive. Then we are in more trouble than I thought. Come on. If you think it's Angus, the Queen's jester, my lord. You've almost made up for losing the great sentinel. Almost. With the oath breaker and the jester in our possession, I think it only a matter of time before the sentinel is ours, my lord. True, I spoke. Very true. Yes, my lord. I would have thought you would have lasted longer, Sir Vedic. You disappoint me. Screw thee, sadist. Hmm. It seems your spirit is not quite broken. I guess another lesson is in order. That is quite all right, my lord. I do know how to fix my toys before I break them again. Where do you want me to put the little fella? Oh, just put him anywhere, Iceberg. I'll get to him as soon as I finish with the big boy here. You leave Angus alone, you sick, twisted sadist. Oh, they are more than adequate. A minor setback, my lord. Nothing more. He just requires another lesson in pain. Pain? Dost thou want to know about pain? Touch the jester and I'll teach thee about pain. You are going to teach me about pain? You know nothing of pain, little troll! I will show you pain like you've never imagined! Ah! Is that good? Oh, yes. Oh, oh no! Varric! So Angus is in Jarek's hands, as is Varric Winter. Yes, my lady. Most likely they are visiting Bob at this moment. <sighs> then we are truly lost. King Jarek has won. No! The hell with that! You came up and plucked me out of my nice little life and brought me down to your nice little realm just so we can all die? No way! You brought me here to fight something or other, so you better damn well better show me how to fight these unnamed bastards and I'll go kick this little chipmunk bastard King Jerry or whatever his name is, alright? <laughs> you see? You see? I told you it would work! I told you it would work! You planned this? Uh-huh. I told them to act depressed and utterly without hope. Why? Because I knew that you wouldn't let them. We needed to get you inspired. You seem so sad and so depressed. We needed something to cheer you up. Angus and Varric should be able to hold up for a while. Nada can teach you a few things that will help you until the two of you can rescue the Winter Wolf and the Jester. My brother. Yes, Neola. Nada... Please take Galen to the meditation chamber. It should be quiet enough there for you to work. Yes, my lady. It shall be done. Do you really think that was enough, my lady? I can't believe Bob really has Angus. If it is not enough, Neola, then pray we'll never live to find out. Now that we're calmed, it's time to center ourselves. How? You know, I don't really know. I've done it so much and for so long it just sort of comes naturally. 
But we shall do our best to figure this out, won't we? Sure. What's first? First, we put our forefingers on our temples. Okay. Sorry, forgot. No talking. I've done this before, so I can, but you really shouldn't. Right. Oh, sorry. Now, do as I do and pay attention. Touching your temples isn't necessary every time you do this, but the first few times you try it, it's a good idea. It helps you focus your attention. Concentrate on an invisible power flowing out of your fingertips, into your head, down through your heart to your belly button where it splits, comes back up your arms, and through your fingers where the cycle repeats. Don't work so hard at it, Galen. Just let it flow naturally. Forcing it will only hinder growth and make it harder to accomplish each consecutive time you attempt. Wow. Now, it won't work just when you want it to. This is something that takes lots of practice to perfect. Do you feel any different? Yeah, it's weird. Even when I close my eyes, I can tell where you are. And that you're... not quite like me. What do you mean? I can tell you're not... human? It's okay, you can say it. I'm not human. I'm an elf. Can I tell where every living thing nearby is? To an extent, you should be able to only detect those of a a higher order, sentient beings. Only those beings that can think. Then why can I tell there are four rats on the other side of the wall? Where? You're kidding. Yeah, I am. Sorry. You should be able to sense Queen Nedra from here, as well as Neola. Nedra is the one who would seem the most familiar, and Neola is the one that has similarities to the Queen. That's because... Because the Queen is of the Fairy Realm and mine. Yes. What is so urgent that you feel you need to do this? To learn? Varric and I are supposed to go on a quest for the Passion Stone. I know, but why do you feel like you must do it today? Just seems like the right thing to do. You answered correctly. It is the right thing to do. What is... Angus is back. Angus? But he was captured by the unnamed and taken to Jarek's. Wasn't he? We better go see. Absolutely, my lord. I thought the little dude would have done some good here. I think he's funnier than Mikey. Nobody is funnier than Mikey. Do you hear me? Y- y- yes, my lord. My lord, I can do better. For whom am I questing, my lord? Rat boy. Rat boy? Why am I bringing rat boy to help us find the rain signal? I don't need... Yes, my lord, at once. I shall leave directly. Yes, my lord. Who is?
is this rat boy. And I take it there is no one better than Rat Boy at this game. I'll never look at Denny's the same way again. Why is that, Galen? Where'd those markings on your face come from? This is a part of the magic I have. It comes about and helps me hide in the night when I work. Oh. So why will you never look at this place the same way again? Because of where we can go through the back door. You mean the kitchen? <laughs> so what exactly are we doing again? We are going to find the Passion Stone to be able to get Varric back. How? Trade it for him? If need be. The Queen would rather lose the war fighting with all her allies than with her most loyal in the crutches of Jarek's sadist. Bob? I refuse to say his name. Afraid it might summon him or something? No, I just think it sounds dumb. An evil, sadistic bastard like that is just called Bob, of all things. Not even something that sounds remotely evil or bad, just Bob. <laughs> so, do you think we'll meet up with Bob? It's a definite possibility. I'm just hoping that Jarek doesn't know where my brother is. Why? Because he's an assassin like me, but he doesn't care about anyone or anything. He just lives for the thrill of the chase and the rush of the kill. Sounds like you were quoting somebody just now. I was. My brother, Rat Boy. What is your... Never mind. Why is what? Why is he called Rat Boy when I have a normal name like Nada? Okay, you asked it. Now answer it. That's not his real name. Hardly anyone calls him by his real name now, though. But he looks like a rat for one thing. He can also, somehow, squeeze through the smallest openings. It's something I never figured out how to do. And it has nothing to do with my size, either. Hey, I didn't say anything. So... How are we going to find the Passion Stone? Where are we going to find it? How are we going to get it? <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. One at a time. Okay, sorry. First, where is the Passion Stone? No, wait. First, I need to know what it is. Fair enough. It's not what it looks like, and it's not what you think it might be. Okay, what does it look like? It's a deep purple heart-shaped gemstone about two and a half inches across, a nice deep dark purple. So what does it do? It's a source of immeasurable and infinite power. Ungodly power. Other than that, I can't tell you. Why not? Because it's different for everyone. Queen Nedra used once to punish King Jarek, but no one else has been able to do that. At least not like she did. Varric had it in his possession when he and Iceberg fought. They both had a hold of it, the intentions of each of them warring within the stone and until it... went. Disappeared. It, it left. Vanished. What do you mean? The power of the Passion Stone couldn't handle the two warring, conflicting passions at the same time, so it gave a little of each to Varric and Iceberg and took itself away. It has been lost ever since. Neither Queen Nedra nor King Jarek has even attempted searching for it, afraid of what it might do now. Where did it come from? This immeasurable source of infinite power. It sounds hokey. It sounds like something from a comic book. You made it. What? I made it? What the hell are you talking about? Cain, the original Thunder Savage, is the one who carved the stone. His next incarnation, Paul St. Valentine, the Rain Sentinel, harnessed the power into it. He gave it to the Winterwolf, Varric, as a gift. That's how the rift began between King Jarek and Queen Nedra. Queen Nedra used the Passion Stone to banish King Jarek from the realm of the Underhollow. That's when Iceberg and Varric had their falling out, and Iceberg came in search of the Passion Stone to gain its power for King Jarek. When he failed in that endeavor, Jarek sent my brother to Paul St. Valentine, my lover, to create a new stone. Paul refused. That is when my brother killed him and took his head. 
Why did... Why did your brother take his... his head? King Jarek, my brother, and Iola all think that when the Passion Stone vanished, it went back to its creator. To keep it completely safe, it was actually inside Paul's head. The power of the stone kept his head alive after... after it was... After it was removed from his neck. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Don't worry about it. No. It was a long time ago and I shouldn't be like this. <sighs> anyway, my brother has Paul's head with the passion stone inside it. It was the one thing he did right. He knew what he had and he kept it so neither side could have it. How do you know this? Because he showed it to me. I've known where the Passion Stone was for a hundred and fifty years and never told a soul. How come? It's too powerful for what's going on. If King Jarek has it, he'll use it to conquer Queen Nedra. If Queen Nedra has it, King Jarek will try to get it from her to use it to conquer the Underhollow Realm. It's a no-win situation. Then why are we going to get it? To hopefully stop Jarek once and for all. I if not... If not? If not, then we destroy it. So how do we find your brother? Do you know where he lives? Nope. He doesn't have a home that I know of. He is constantly on the move. Then how are we supposed to find him? Remember that trick I taught you? Centering? You'll use that to find it. How? I've only done it once and not very well. You did fine for your first time. I've known elves raised in the Underhollow who couldn't sense a fairy if it was sitting in the palm of their hand. Okay, but that doesn't explain how I'm supposed to locate something I've never seen before. Have you been listening to a word I've been saying, Galen? The Passion Stone was first made by Cain, then empowered by Paul St. Valentine. Yeah, I caught that. You are the current incarnation of those two. You made the stone. You you empowered the fucking thing in your past lives as Cain and Paul. Then how come I don't remember being either one of them, huh? All right, you want proof? You'll get your damn proof. Who said anything about proof? All I said was I don't remember being Cain or Paul. That's it. Fine, say it however you want. You won't believe it until you have proof. Well, let's go get you some. Damn know-it-all up world bastard. Damn it. Where are you going now? Damn it. So, you got to take Mikey with you to find Rat Boy. I do not envy you, big boy. Yeah, taking the most annoying goblin with you to find the guy who's gonna replace you. That must suck. Tell me about it. Ever since we left Queen Nitra, I can't seem to do anything right. I'm constantly screwing up, it seems. Hey, <laughs> I got an idea. Why not kill Rat Boy and show the king how good you are? Kill. Rat boy, that's a brilliant idea. Kill Rat boy. I should kill you for even suggesting that I try and kill Rat boy. I should kill both you nuts for even talking about kill Rat boy. What a great idea, Binks, my boy. You finally had a good idea. I can't believe I didn't think of it myself. Kill Rat Boy to show King Jared I'm still good enough to lead the army. And you, dear friend Rockfoot, you're going to go with me. <laughs> the hell I will, Bird. I will do no such thing. Why would you want to take me with you anyway? Because, Rockfoot, I can keep an eye on you, and you won't go running back to the king with this news. Besides, you're gonna be my distraction while I kill the bastard. Ah! <laughs>
Do you drool over the latest cutting-edge technology? Are you the first in line for the latest sci-fi movie? Do you stay up late at night playing video games? Do you consider being called a geek a badge of honor? Then you should listen to Geek Cred. Steve Rickyberg gives you the inside scoop on everything geek. From tech to sci-fi to games, you name it, we geek it. Geek Cred. Are you geek enough? To download and subscribe, visit www.geekcred.net and get your geek on. It's that time again after missing them for a month. The 18th installment of the Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd is up next. It's time once again for America's favorite show, The Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. Brought to you by DrFloyd.com. Our show begins this week aboard the ship of the evil mastermind, Dr. Steve, and his sock shaped assistant fidget. We find Dr. Steve in the sleeping quarters of his ship, no doubt planning some nefarious scheme to wreak havoc in the time and space stream using the time and space travel device he stole from our hero, Dr. Floyd. Now, where could I have left it? Well, I'm looking for my Teddy Sleeps Lot Bear. I know he's around here somewhere. <laughs> well, laugh all you'd like, Fidget. You know I can't take my afternoon siesta without him. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. My room is a bit of a jungle. I just haven't had time to... Wait, that's it. Fidget, to the controls. Set a course for November 9th, 1871, in what is now present-day Tanzania, Africa. <laughs> we are going to pay a little visit to another doctor. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Fidget are preparing to make their jump to the very fast of space and time. As they do, let's check in with our heroes, the world's most brilliant scientist, Dr. Floyd, his young protege, Dr. Grant, and their faithful robot companion, Chips. Dr. Grant, how did the ship's self-diagnostics turn out? Everything looks good, Dr. Floyd. We just have to... <laughs> Dr. Steve and Fidget have made a time jump. Where did they jump to, Chips? <laughs> Africa. Africa. Jinx. Jinx. What in Sam Hill are you talking about? Ow! What in tarnation are you doing, Dr. Grant? Why did you hit me? Because I jinxed you, and you spoke before I released you from the jinx. What the? I think you're going batty, Dr. Grant. You need to go lay down. No, Dr. Floyd, it's a game that I used to play as a kid. When you and someone else say the same thing at the same time, you can say jinx, and then the other person can't talk until their name is said three times. If they do talk before that, which you did, you get to sock them in the arm. Dr. Grant, we don't have time for you to play any of your little hippie games. Dr. Steve has made a time jump. We haven't got a moment to lose. Chips, follow him. Let's go now to the deep dark jungles of Africa and Ujiji, which is now present-day Tanzania. A sinister black time and spaceship materializes and lands on the banks of the Nile River, and Dr. Steve and Fidget, both in pith helmets, step out. Uh, Ah, here we are, Fidget, the deep, dark jungles of Africa. Why are we doing this? Well, according to history, on November 10th, 1871, which is tomorrow, a journalist named Henry Morton Stanley will come face to face with one of the greatest African explorers of all time, Dr. David Livingston. When they meet, Stanley will utter the famous phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume? My plan is to get to Livingston first and utter that famous phrase so that history records my name as the one who found Livingston. Where are we going to find him? I have no idea where we'll find him, Fidget. He was searching for the source of the Nile River, and Stanley picked up his trail near Lake Tangaika, so I figure we should just start there. Oh, okay. Why not? Well, I don't know where that is either, Fidget. What we need is some sort of guy. At just that moment, a boat with about 15 passengers comes trucking up the Nile River, driven by a man dressed in khaki. He expertly pulls up the boat to the bank in front of Dr. Stephen Fidget. Howdy! You guys need a guide? Actually, we do. Well, then you've come to the right place. Well, actually, I've come to the right place. This is the world-famous jungle boat trip. Hop on board the old Magdalena Maiden here, and I'll take you wherever you need to go. Skipper Don Chapman's the name, but you can just call me Skip. Fidget, can you believe our luck? I'm Limbo. Okay, come on board. Better yet, come on excited. Watch your step and watch your head. If you miss your step and hit your head, watch your language. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's funny. Go ahead, slide down. The closer you sit together, the better the heating works. So, where are you guys from? Saddle River. I'm sorry? Saddle River? No, I heard you. I was just saying I'm sorry. Wave goodbye to the people on the dock there. You'll never see them again. Well, there's no people on the dock, and there's not even a dock. Is this your first trip into the jungle? Well, yes, yes it is. Oh, good. It's mine, too. <laughs> oh, brother, this is going to be a long trip. Dr. Steve is heading through the jungle to try and sabotage the famous first meeting of Henry Morton Stanley and Dr. David Livingston. Will Dr. Steve succeed and change history forever? Will Dr. Floyd and the gang make it in time to stop Dr. Steve? Will Skip's jokes get any better? Tune in next week for the further Radio Avengers of Dr. Floyd. It's time once again for America's favorite show, The Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. Brought to you by DrFloyd.com.
It is November 9th, 1871, and we are in the deep, dark jungles of Africa. It is here that we find the evil villain Dr. Steve and his sock-shaped assistant Fidget on their quest to find the famous explorer, Dr. David Livingston. Dr. Steve is planning to utter the historic phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume, before Henry Morton Stanley is able to. The two dastardly rogues are currently traveling down the Nile River aboard the riverboat the Magdalena Maiden, which is being piloted by jungle guy Don Skip Chapman. Ladies and gentlemen, on the right is old Smiley the Crocodile. Please keep your hands inside the boat, as old Smiley is always looking for a hand out. Fidget, keep your hands inside. I don't want to do we are now entering the sacred bathing pool of the elephants. Uh, go ahead and take pictures if you'd like, folks. It looks as if the elephants all have their trunks on. What is he talking about? They're not wearing anything. <laughs> as Dr. Stephen Fitcher travel down the Nile River, let's check in with our hero, Dr. Floyd, his young protege, Dr. Grant, and their faithful robot companion, Chip. Jeepers, Dr. Floyd, what could Dr. Steve want in the middle of this deep, dark jungle? I'm not sure exactly, Dr. Grant, but I think he may be trying to thwart the meeting of Dr. David Livingston and Henry Morton Stanley. You mean the whole Dr. Livingston, I presume, thing? Exactly. We have to find Stanley and make sure he arrives at Livingston's camp before Dr. Steve does. Do you know where that is? No, but we... What is it, Chips? He says that there are about 30 life forms closing in on our location. Life forms? What does he mean by life forms? Maybe he means a life form like that guy standing behind you with a spear? What in turnation? As Dr. Floyd spins around, he comes face to face with the business end of a razor sharp spear. Holding the spear is a very angry looking native. Thundering out of the bushes come 29 other natives who have our heroes completely surrounded. As our heroes decide what to do, let's return to Dr. Stephen Fidget, who are still on board the jungle boat, the Magdalena Maiden. Up ahead is an explorer's outpost. We'll stop in and see if he's seen Dr. Livingston. I was by here earlier and. Uh... Uh-oh. Looks like that group of gorillas has overrun the camp. They don't make any sounds like a banana. These guys find that very appealing. Oh, brother. We'd better look elsewhere for Dr. Livingston. Up ahead is beautiful Schweitzer Falls, named after that famous African explorer, Dr. Albert Falls. No, 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 that's not right, Fidget. I do believe his name was Dr. Schweitzer. <laughs> We're now entering into the most dangerous part of our journey. We'll be traveling through the hippo pool. These creatures have been known to overturn a boat if they feel threatened. Uh, how many of you want to turn back? Well, if it's dangerous, we probably should. Uh, how many of you want to go forward? <laughs> Uh, how many of you are completely apathetic about the whole situation? <laughs> now, the local natives tell me that these hippos are only dangerous when they're wiggling their ears and blowing bubbles, which is exactly what they are doing. Oh, okay, hang on, folks. I'll scare them away. Ooh, hold me, fidget. Okay, folks, looks like they're gone. <laughs> I did not scream like a little girl. Let's now leave Fidget and Dr. Steve, who did indeed scream like a little girl, and see how our heroes are faring with a group of natives who have them surrounded. What are we going to do now, Dr. Floyd? I don't know, Dr. Grant. Just remain calm. Uh, yes, hello there. We come as friends. I want a Wonka. Dr. Floyd, Chip says that he knows what they are saying. What? You do? <laughs> Fluent in over six million languages? <laughs> well, wonders never cease. Well, tell them that we are peaceful and we're just looking for Dr. Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Floyd, how do the natives understand chips? Shh, be quiet, Dr. Grant. Don't ask questions. Yate, yate, yoda. What did he say, chips? <laughs> did he just say what I think he said they said, Dr. Floyd? Yes. He said they're taking us prisoner. The natives form a tighter circle around our heroes, spears pointed menacingly at them. Hold me, Dr. Grant. With much regret, we must now leave our heroes in this perilous situation and check in one last time with the evil mastermind, Dr. Steve, who is nearing the end of his jungle cruise. Unfortunately, we're not in the clear yet, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to enter headhunter country, and that's a very dangerous place to be headed. Well, this is just going from bad to worse. This was a bad idea, Fidget. Up there on the bank is Trader Sam. He's the head salesman here in the jungle. He's running a special today. Two of his heads for one of yours. Wait, why are you pulling the boat over? This is your stop. What? No, we're not getting out in headhunter country. It was a joke. You'll be fine. The village right next to this one is the village where Dr. Livingston is staying. Oh, really? Well, uh, well thank you then. <laughs> Please watch your step as you get out. That dock there is made of hickory, and when it gets wet, it can become quite slick. It's what we call in the jungle a slippery hickory dock. <laughs> oh, brother. Quick, Fidget. Let's get out of here. Dr. Steve and Fidget are now only one village away from Dr. Livingston, while our heroes have been taken prisoner by some hostile jungle natives. Will Dr. Steve beat Henry Morton Stanley to Dr. Livingston? Will our heroes escape in time to stop Dr. Steve? And just how do the natives understand chips anyway? Find out the answer to these questions and more next week when you'll hear Don Skip Chapman say... Oh, if you guys get into any trouble out there, just give me a yell. Well, what should we yell? Just say... Help! That's next week on the Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. It's time once again for America's favorite show, The Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. Brought to you by DrFloyd.com. 
It is the early hours of the morning of November 10, 1871. As the sun rises on the deepest, darkest part of the African jungle, we find our heroes, Dr. Floyd, his young protege, Dr. Grant, and their faithful robot companion, Chips, tied to stakes in the middle of a hut in a native village. Prisoners of a band of fearsome-looking natives. Dr. Floyd, are you awake? I guess so. I was kind of hoping this was all a dream. What are we going to do? I don't know, Dr. Grant, but we've got to come up with something fast, or else Dr. Steve is going to mess up the meeting of Dr. Livingston and Henry Morton Stanley. Yeah, not to mention the fact that we're being held captive and we have no idea what these natives are planning to do to us. <laughs> Chip says someone is coming. Shh. Just then, the native that captured our heroes enters the hut. Nachuba negatori. Na, na, natuta. What did he say, Chips? <laughs> he says he's here to prepare us for a ceremony. Chips, ask him what kind of ceremony. <laughs> oh, shuda. <laughs> A shrunken head ceremony? ceremony? Jinx! We have no time to play your silly playground games, Dr. Grant. We're in serious trouble. You were so lucky that we're tied to these stakes, or else you would get such a punch. As our heroes try their best to digest the news that has just been given to them, let's catch up with the evil mastermind Dr. Steve and his sock-shaped assistant Fidget, who are now only a village away from catching up with Dr. David Livingston. Come on, Fidget, we can't waste any more time. We have to get to Dr. David Livingston, so I can say Dr. Livingston, I presume? <laughs> what? Henry Morton Stanley? Where? <laughs> Sure enough, up ahead on the trail, Dr. Steve sees Henry Morton Stanley. He breaks into a sprint to try to catch up to him. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, hello there. Top of the morning to you. Uh, yes, uh, same to you. Are you Henry Morton Stanley? Why, yes, I am. And you were looking for Dr. Livingston, are you not? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, uh, well, you are very close. His, uh, his village is just right up the road there. Well, this is delightfully good news. I appreciate it. Have you given any thought to what you're going to say when you meet Dr. Livingston finally? Well, I just figured I'd say... Hello! Oh, no, 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 that just won't do. This is the kind of meeting that will go down in the history books. You need a good opener, something that will be remembered for the ages. Boy, Jove, I believe you're right. I'd better come up with a real humdinger. How about this? This is one small handshake for man and one giant hug for mankind. Uh, no, that won't work. Uh, here, you'd better sit down here on this tree trunk and think about it more. You don't want to look the fool when you meet him face to face. Yes, you're right. Hmm, the only thing we have to fear is meeting oneself. No. No, no, no. As Henry Morton Stanley sits down on the log to ponder what line he should open with, Dr. Stephen Fidget turn and start running towards the village they are now just moments away from. This is the very same village where we find our heroes Dr. Floyd, Dr. Grant, and Chips. They are now standing in front of a large bonfire surrounded by the entire population of the village. Golly, Dr. Floyd, things don't look good for us. Just hold on, Dr. Grant. Our goose isn't cooked yet. Just then, a native draped in feathers and a large wooden mast steps out of a small thatched roof hut. He holds his arms aloft, and the moment he does, the drumming stops. Silence fills the air. Who is that, Dr. Floyd? I think it's the witch doctor. He walks menacingly over to our heroes. He regards each of them with an air of suspicion. He then turns to the assembled village and clears his throat and in a loud, clear voice. The witch doctor says, Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, ting, walla, walla, bing, bang. Ah. I should have seen that coming a mile away. Chips, what is he saying? <laughs> oh no, he's welcoming everybody to the ceremony of the shrunken head. Malikalikamaka. With that, the witch doctor pulls out a very long, sharp blade and moves around behind Dr. Floyd. In one swift moment, he raises the blade high above his head. Mama say, mama sa, mama ma, kusa. The crowd cheers as the blade is brought swiftly down, neatly severing Dr. Floyd restraints. Dr. Floyd stands there, looking at his hands, which are now free. What? What's going on? Ha <laughs> ha, ta 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 <laughs> well, I'll be. I don't understand. I thought we were goners for sure. No, Dr. Floyd. Chip says that this is the celebration of the shrunken head, and you are the guest of honor. Well, doesn't that mean they're going to shrink our heads? No, Dr. Floyd. They are celebrating what they call the coming of the god of the shrunken heads. Well, who's that now? <laughs> well, it's you, Dr. Floyd. I'm the god of the shrunken head? I don't under... Dang, nebbit! A roar of laughter came up from the crowd, and Dr. Grant and Chips were freed from their bonds. Your small head has saved us, Dr. Floyd. As Dr. Grant panned Dr. Floyd on the head, he notices a small man with a big white beard come out of a hut. Dr. Floyd, look, it's Dr. Livingston. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Now I know exactly who I'm looking for. Dr. Floyd, Dr. Grant, and Chips all spin around to see Dr. Stephen Fisher standing right beside them. Before they realize what is happening, Dr. Steve is already walking over to Dr. David Livingston. Dr. Floyd, we've got to do something. Our heroes begin running behind Dr. Steve, and they all reach Dr. David Livingston at the exact same time. Dr. Dr. Livingston, Livingston, I presume? Oh, I say. What did you say? Before they could ask again, Dr. Floyd yelled loudly, Jinx! Jinx on you, Dr. Steve. You can't talk now until I say your name two more times. If you do, I can punch you. Dr. Steve's face turned a bright red. He was caught and he knew it. As evil as Dr. Steve is, he always obeys international jinx rules. It's just the way he was brought up. As he stood there fuming at the now laughing Dr. Floyd, he didn't notice the man coming up behind him. It was Henry Morton Stanley. Dr. Livingston, I presume? Why, yes, it is. Well, how delightful. I've been looking all over for you. Dejected, Dr. Steve began walking back down the village trail. Dr. Floyd called after him. Better luck next time, Dr. Steve. That's two. You say his name one more time and he'll be able to talk. It would be cruel if he wasn't allowed to talk, Dr. Grant. Goodbye, Dr. Steve. I'll get Get you, Floyd. Dr. Stephen Fitcher returned to their ship and jumped back into the time and space stream, no doubt plotting another fiendish scheme. Our hero spent the remainder of the day
today with their new native friends and Henry Morton Stanley and Dr. David Livingston. Where will Dr. Steve go next? Will our heroes be able to stop him? Will Dr. Floyd ever live down the fact that he saved the day with his incredibly small head? Tune in next week to the Radio Avengers of Dr. Floyd to find out. And that's this week's show. Oh, until next week when we look at some ancient radio drama, I'm Jack Ward.